In Lord of the Rings, Tolkien tells a story of many heroes. Sam and Frodo bring the One Ring as close to its doom as possible. They went further with it than most other beings of Middle-earth would be able to. Bilbo found the One Ring, helped the dwarves, which led to Smaug's defeat and later even abandoned the ring with a little help of Gandalf, an unimaginable feat of willpower. Speaking of Gandalf, he positioned characters at the right places over the centuries and took actions against all odds to force Sauron to move. If he would have failed, all would be lost. All those stories we can read in the books and see in the films, but there are other heroes often forgotten. Today we look at an elf in the background and that is literally where you can see him in the films. They show him only twice and completely ignore his story, even though nobody had his foresight in Middle-earth. Would he have failed, all would be lost too. He fought with many kings over the ages in the great battles that would be sung later. For example, he fought with the last alliance of elves and men. We can see his banner in the prologue of the Fellowship of the Ring movie, a nice little reference. But he also fought 3400 years prior with the first leaders of men or the Edain to be precise. He gave advice to the powerful and worked tirelessly in the backgrounds against all odds. He is probably one of the oldest elves, if not the oldest, living in Middle-earth, so old that he had a long beard. He was brave and loyal, bringing great sacrifices for the greater good. He truly is an unsung hero and one of my favorite characters in Tolkien's universe. It's Círdan, the shipwright. Before we continue, two hints. I try to pronounce the names as Tolkien described it or as it makes sense looking at the roots of the words. This means a lot of rolled R's. To explain Círdan and his early story, I have to explain a ton of Elvish law from the First Age. This video could almost be titled The History of the Teleri and Noldor Elves, but I take several shortcuts and let out some parts to bring the focus back to Círdan, but the First Age is very complex and all events are somehow connected. It must also be mentioned that I focus on Tolkien's mythology from his main works. As mentioned, Círdan is actually shown in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy. He is played by Michael Ellsworth, who also played this guy in the archives of Minas Tirith. However, we see Círdan at the beginning wearing Narya, one of the three elven rings of power, together with Galadriel and the High King of the Noldor Elves, Gil-galad. And we see him at the end of Return of the King in Mithlond, the Grey Havens, together with Galadriel and her husband Celeborn, like a frame for the movies, which does him justice. However, the movies depict him without a beard. Male elves usually don't have one, but when they are very old and in their late life cycle, some speak of the third life cycle, they can grow a beard, which was the case for Círdan. In The Return of the King we can read, As they came to the gates, Círdan the shipwright came forth to greet them. Very tall he was and his beard was long and he was grey and old, save that his eyes were keen as stars. But this is the end of the Lord of the Rings at the Grey Havens. Where does it all start? Círdan was born as Noah between the years of the trees 1050 and 1149, so between the awakening of the elves and him staying in Middle-earth after the Great Journey. He could potentially be part of the small group of the first elves in existence. That makes him very old and far older than even Galadriel, who was born Years of the Trees 1362. If you have seen my video about the white trees and their origins, you know that this is ancient. The years of the trees are also not solar years but valiant years, so 9.582 solar years are one valiant year. If we calculate his age, he is between 10,412 and 11,361 solar years old when Frodo reaches Rivendell. Galadriel is only 8,371 at this time in comparison. If you ask yourself why he's described looking old as an elf, he lived in Middle-earth his whole recorded life and has never seen the light of Aman, the Undying Lens. Galadriel, in contrast, lived in Amman for some time and has seen the light of the two trees. In addition, the other known elves in Middle-earth are much younger. Middle-earth is a continent of change, Amman is not, which is why it's called the Undying Land. At least that's my interpretation. All elves must at some point go there or they fade into the unseen world. 
But let's continue. Nove was kin to Olwe and Elwe, who should later become King Thingol. Elwe and Olwe were also born in Cuivienen, where the elves awoke. They led the great journey for the Teleri elves, so it is possible that Círdan was already alive at this time too. But let me explain the great journey of the elves a bit from the law's perspective. I have to take some shortcuts though. Kuivienen was a bay at the shores of the Sea of Helkar that is interestingly around where Mordor is during the Third Age of the Years of the Sun, a bit further to the east, so behind Mordor. In Tolkien's mythology the world was shaped differently at this time and also had changed from its original design by Eru Iluvatar, that is God, his high angels the Valar and probably to some degree his lower angels the Mayar because of the rebellious nature of of the evil Valar Melkor, the master of Sauron from ancient times. Originally the world just had one symmetrical continent and two lamps on giant towers as light source called Iluin and Ormal. The Sea of Helkar is the crater where Iluin collapsed after Melkor destroyed the two lamps. The crater filled with water and formed the sea and here the elves awoke at the mentioned bay. As mentioned, Sauron's master Melkor, who should later be known as Morgoth, is the main reason behind the great journey. When the elves awoke, he found them first and started to corrupt them. When the other Valar found the elves through Orome, the huntsmen of the Valar, they were worried and needed to get the elves away from Melkor's influence and stop him. And so they started and won the war for sake of the elves against Melkor, which bound him for three ages and destroyed his first stronghold Udun in the north. When the powerful entities clashed, the Darkland separated from Middle Earth south, where the other great lamp Ormal once collapsed. After the war, the Valar invited the elves to their undying lands on their continent, Aman, in the far west. Depending on their, you could say, clans, the elves split into three groups, Vanyar, Noldor and Teleri. We know many Noldor elves from the Lord of the Rings, like Gil-galad, Galadriel and Elrond, but also some Teleri and related elves, like Círdan, Thranduil and Celeborn, who are Sindar elves to be precise. There are likely no Vanyar elves in Middle-earth. The Vala Orome took one ambassador from each group, namely Ingwe, Finwe and the mentioned Elwe and brought them to Valinor, the capital of the Valar on Aman, to speak for their people at the council of the Valar. After they returned to their people and convinced them to leave, the great journey begins. That means all three group of elves will travel to Aman, which is a long journey through Middle Earth and over the ocean. Just for sake of completeness, there were also elves among the Noldor and Teleri elves who did not want to go on the great journey. They will be known as the Avari, which means the refusers. Sometimes they are also called dark elves, but this term has some different meanings. They will have a problematic relationship with the Noldor and Sindar later. I am coming to what Sindar elves are soon. However, parts of the Avari mixed with the Nandor elves, that are the Sylvan and Green elves. For example, the people of Thranduil, even though he is a Cinder himself, are Sylvan elves. Originally, the Nandor elves were a group of Teleri elves who aborted the great journey around the Anduin and stayed there, but the story is far more complicated and is probably for another video. Only mentioned here to confuse you more. The great journey of the three main groups slowly moved through Middle-earth and halted when they finally reached the west coast land of Middle-earth called Beleriand. They were a bit afraid of the ocean and even moved back a bit into the land. Still they had to cross the ocean, but how should they bring so many elves over to Amman? The Valar had an interesting solution for this. They used an island as a giant ship, which they separated from another local island, Balar. The island would be later known as Tol Eresea and was pushed by the Valar Ulmo, king of the sea. He is like Poseidon. Not all elves could be transported on the island the first time because the Teleri still dwelt in the east of Beleriand. So they did not hear the summon to come to the island and missed it. 
The events around this, described in the Silmarillion, are a bit difficult to put into a chronological order. So this is my interpretation of it. The reason for this is that different views on the stories are split into different chapters, which tell the same story again but with other details. They all tell the same story, but with some parts it's not clear in what chronological order they happen. For example, Elwë want to visit Finwë, but it's not stated when exactly this happened. I assume when the Venjar and Noldor fell back into the land and before they were summoned to the floating island. Tolkien wanted to create mythology told from the perspective of a translator who found fictional records. Elements like this are imitating the real world. Even in history there are sometimes different sources or recordings of the same event with small differences. What is important, around this time Elwë, the leader of the Teleri, went to visit his close friend Finwë, the leader of the Noldor elves, but went missing in the woods and the Teleri started to search for him for a very long time. Ulmo then only took the Vanya and Noldor on the island with him to Aman, while the Teleri, including Norwë, were left behind. I assume because the Teleri were still too far away, maybe they even got delayed because they searched for Elwë. In Aman, the Noldor and especially Finwë missed their friends and begged the Valar to also bring them to Aman, so Ulmo had to return with the island Tol Eresea to Middle-earth and fetch them. And now Norway's story begins. What is necessary to understand? It was every elf's greatest desire to see Aman and the light of Valinor, the two trees, with their own eyes, especially Norway's and Elwes, who is the only cinder who actually has seen the light of the trees himself, because he was there once as one of the three ambassadors. They really wanted to go there and see it, so the Teleri moved to the shores of Beleriand and they loved the water. This sounds a bit oddly phrased, but what I mean is the culture of the Teleri evolved around water. While waiting there, the Teleri got a bit impatient and thought of ways to get to the other side. Nowhere in his eager started to learn how to build ships. I always imagine how he builds and tests prototypes of ships and does research on navigation because the elves, the firstborn, were still young, not knowing too much about sailing a huge ocean. It's a bit difficult to determine the exact point, but as mentioned Elwë, the Teleri leader and relative of Norwë, explored the woods and did not return, so the Teleri started to search for him. It is described how Norwë was most loyal and eager to find him, even after the others gave up searching. It must be noted that Elwë was missing for a very long time, possibly centuries. So what happened to Elwë in the meantime? In the forest of Nan Elmoth, Elwë met Melian the Maya, a so to say angel of lower rank. Gandalf, Saruman but also Sauron or the Balrogs are all Mayar. They are Ainur, spirit beings, but they usually take a physical form. They are the helpers of the Valar, the higher angels. Melian served Yavanna, the queen of nature, but also served other Valar and is described as immeasurably beautiful, the wisest of her kin and none of her kin was more skilled in songs of enchantment than her. It was her who taught the nightingales to sing. When Melian and Elwë met both fell in love and were enchanted in this moment for years. We can read so that they stood thus while long years were measured by the wheeling stars above them and the trees of Nan Elmos grew tall and dark before they spoke any word. In the meantime the Teleri got company by Ose and his wife Uinen, both Mayar of Ulmo, and developed a friendship with the elves. Ose taught them sea law and sea music which should influence the Teleri, same with life at the shore. The Maya Ose, whose realm the shores of Middle-earth were, enjoyed the company of the Teleri much and persuaded some of them to stay. When the Valar Ulmo arrived again with the island to fetch the Teleri, Elwë still hasn't returned. And so the Teleri split up. Elwë's brother Olwë became their new leader and led the bigger part of the Teleri to Aman. The other, I assume, decided not to leave without Elwë or were persuaded by Ose. This was a huge sacrifice for Norway, and so a group stayed at the shores of Beleriand while the others reached Aman. Those who stayed were called Falavrim, coast people, and Norway, kin of Elwe and Olwe, became their lord, dwelling in Falas. 
He stood at the shores and saw how the lights of the island slowly disappeared in the distance. In his mind he planned to find Elwe and then sail over to Aman with the ship he has built, even if he had to sail alone. We can read in the peoples of Middle-earth that he cried aloud, I will follow that light alone if none will come with me, for the ship that I have been building is now almost ready. But then he heard a voice in his head and saw a vision. Through that vision the Valar told him that he and his ships were still not good enough to reach the shores of Aman and showed him a flying white ship, Vingilot, the ship of Elrond's father Earendil, who will later become Círdan's apprentice and the shipwright will help him build this ship. It would be enchanted by the Valar to fly through the sky and the Silmaril, one of three legendary gems imbued with the light of the two trees of Valinor that Earendil wore, would be seen as a star in the sky and be known as the Star of Earendil. In Tolkien's notes published in the History of Middle-earth books we can read a shape like a white boat shining above him that sailed west through the air and as it dwindled in the distance it looked like a star of so great a brilliance that it cast a shadow of Círdan upon the strand where he stood. He also got foresight from the Valar even beyond that of Elrond's or Galadriel's but he had to stay in Middle-earth and Noé answered I obey. It was also here where he who was known as Noé until this event took the Sindari name Círdan which means shipbuilder. It feels a bit like a tautology when we read Círdan the shipwright in the books but it underlines how his profession is one of his most defining features. As a lord of the Sindar it also makes sense that he spoke Sindarin but the language must have been very young at this point. So the language of the isolated Teleri developed further. The name Noe was Quenya, the other elvish language which developed earlier and is for example spoken by the elves in Aman. This development of language also indicates that all these events did not just took a few years but literally centuries. In Falas, Círdan and his people started building ships and the cities Eglares and Brithombar, the two havens of Falas. At some point, which is a bit difficult to determine, Elwe returned with Melian. The centuries he was missing, being like in trance, made him almost like a Maya too and he became the king of the remaining Teleri elves. He was known as Elu Thingol, establishing his realm Dorias. Thingol means grey mantle and his people were known as the Sindar, the grey elves. To be precise, the elves still living at the shores in Falas under Círdan were the mentioned Faladhrim and the elves in Dorias were the Eglas, the forsaken people. With his wife Melian and the Eglas he then founded the kingdom of Dorias. They also later built their capital Menegros, the thousand caves. All this takes its time, about 1500 years. About 1000 years after Menegros was built the evil Vala Melkor was released again. So three ages have passed that are about 3000 years. Of course he would cause trouble again in Amman and Middle-earth. He rebuilt his second fortress Angband in Middle-earth using it as his lair. He then allied with Ungoliant, that Shelob's mother, destroyed the two trees of Valinor with her help, murdered the high king of the Noldor, Finwë, stole the masterpiece of Finwë's oldest son Feanor, the three legendary gems called the Silmarili, betrayed Ungoliant, got rescued by his Balrogs and then decided to conquer Beleriand. Keep Feanor and his seven sons in mind, they will occur quite often during the first age. It's very difficult to understand the first age and its political situation without this part of the story, so bear with me. What all those events now caused was that Feanor cursed Melkor, calling him Morgoth, which should become his new name and Feanor and his seven sons swore an oath to return the Silmarili by any means necessary, which should turn into a curse for his family, parts of the Noldor and most whoever had something to do with the three Silmarili. This was part of the first prophecy of Mandos, also called the Doom of Mandos, probably because this actually doomed a lot of elves. The oath and the hunt for the Silmarilli and to some degree the Silmarilli themselves became a terrible curse that influenced the complete first age. 
to retrieve the Silmarilli, Feanor needed armies because he had to confront Morgoth and so he convinced almost all Noldor elves to come with him back to Middle Earth. Feanor also needed ships to get over the ocean. He asked the Teleri of Aman, so those led by Olwe, to give them their ships, but they declined, which escalated into Feanor and his people taking the ships by force and even murdering the Teleri, which is known as the first kinsling. Feanor's half-brother Finarfin, which is Galadriel's father and probably his older brother Fingolfin, did not participate in the kinsling. However, Fingolfin's men arrived and helped thinking Feanor was attacked by the Teleri. This is also the first example of this oath turning into a curse that brings doom over those who have contact with Feanor and his seven sons. The story becomes quite complex, so I have to take a few shortcuts. I also explained it a few times in other videos, so here's a short version. In the end, Galadriel's father Finarfin did not go back to Middle-earth because he listened to the mentioned prophecy of Mandos, the doomsman of the Valar, which he understood as warning. Finarfin was the wisest of Finwë's sons, but his own sons and one of his daughters, which is no other than Galadriel, did not want to leave their Noldor brethren behind. They also were ashamed to go back to the Valar and so sailed to Middle-earth, not listening to their father and Mandos. The doom of Mandos also included a banishment from Aman for these Noldor elves. When Feanor arrived in Middle-earth with the ships stolen from the Teleri, he burned the ships instead of sending them back to get the others. The Noldor elves in Aman could see the smoke, so Fingolfin, Finarfin's children and their armies and people had to travel over Helcaraxe, a connection of ice from Aman to Middle-earth. It's a very dangerous and deadly route through an ice desert which cost many lives. The remaining Noldor were of course angry at Feanor but as mentioned also ashamed to go back to the Valar and so went on this dangerous march. During this the years of the trees ended and the years of the sun began. They saw the moon rising the first time and arrived in Middle Earth shortly after when the sun rose the first time. As you will notice, this happens after Feanor landed in Middle-earth. Chronology is a bit difficult because so many things happen in parallel, but keep this event in mind. Before the first Noldor arrived, Morgoth started war, the first battle of Beleriand, with the Sindar elves in the years of the trees 1497, three to four valiant years before the beginning of the first age of the years of the sun. The war took place at two sides. One army of Morgoth attacked the kingdom of Dorias from the east and the other attacked Falas in the west. Círdan and his people lost the battle and had to retreat, resulting in the siege of both of his cities. King Thingol and his people got help from a Nandor group of elves, the Lyquendi, the mentioned green elves who dwelt in Osiriand in the east. But they were not well equipped for warfare and suffered great losses. Even the king Denethor was slain. The dwarves from Belegost came to help too. Thingol later rewarded them with pearls that Círdan and his people in Falas found in the shallow waters around the Isle of Balar. One of them was as big as a dove's egg called Nymphilos and the dwarves valued it more than a mountain of treasure because they did not knew pearls. As beings that valued the earth and underground they feared the oceans and avoided the shores. The skilled dwarvish craftsmen also helped the Sindar elves making weapons, which the elves didn't need before. As hinted, it was not looking good for the Sindar and like Wendy, especially for Círdan in Falas. But then the mentioned Feanor arrived with his armies and the orcs had to abandon the siege and were ordered north to help their master. In this time, Melian the Maya also created a magical fence around Dorias that no one less powerful could enter against her will, the so-called Girdle of Melian. This is also when the land became actually known as Dorias, which means land of the fence. Before that it was known as Eglador, the land of the forsaken. The arrival of Feanor started the Dagor Nuin Gilias, the battle under the start. Sun and moon were not created yet. Of course, Morgoth did not want the Noldor to establish themselves in Beleriand and attacked them. That's why he called back the orcs from Falas, absconding the siege of Círdan's cities. But the orcs were ambushed by Celegorm, one of Feanor's sons and got totally destroyed. 
There's also the Battle of Lamoth. It's only mentioned in Tolkien's notes published in the Peoples of Middle-earth book long after his death, which makes it not clear how canon it is. When much later the mentioned Fingolfin arrived in Beleriand in Lamoth, he found an army of orcs that Morgoth sent there to attack Fëanor's weir. Fingolfin and his army were surprised but managed to defeat them, else they potentially could have caused a lot of trouble for Fëanor and his sons. I think it's a good introduction of Fingolfin arriving in Beleriand. The Noldor elves caused Morgoth great losses, probably because they were still empowered by the light of Valinor. The war was almost won. Fëanor, in his wrath, pursued the fleeing orcs towards Angband, Morgoth's fortress, but there he got surrounded by Balrogs. He fought them off for some time impressively, but in the end got heavily wounded and smitten down by Gothmog, the leader of the Balrogs and one of the highest servants of Morgoth with Sauron. His sons came and even managed to drive the Balrogs away, but Fëanor died to his wounds a bit later. The curse doomed the first of those who swore the oath of Fëanor. With this Maithros, Fëanor's eldest son became High King of the Noldor for a short time, but he got tricked and captured by Morgoth. Fingolfin's son Fingon, that's also Galadriel's cousin, managed to free him with the help of Thorondor, King of the Eagles, and after that, out of gratitude, Maithros dropped his claim to be king and his uncle Fingolfin became High King of the Noldor elves. However, Fëanor's son still did what they wanted. This was around the year 5 of the first age of the years of the sun. You could ask, did the Sindar, some of them Teleri, willingly work together with the Noldor who murdered their kin in Aman? Well, the Noldor did not tell the Sindar what they did. They pretended to be sent by the Valar to help them against Morgoth. This is a very interesting detail that unfolds in your mind how this curse actually works. You know by now that it can't end well. It must also be noted that with the first rising of the sun also men awoke in the east of Middle-earth. We come to them later. First age 20, Fingolfin, High King of the Noldor elves celebrated the Meres Aderthat. It was a reunion celebration between the Noldor and the Sindar. Círdan also participated and all swore to help each other against their common foe Morgoth in the north. And it happened what Morgoth wanted to prevent. The Noldor elves established themselves in Beleriand. Around first age 50, Galadriel and her older brother Finrod were guests in King Thingol's halls. There she met the Sindar Celeborn and fall in love with him. From Milian she learned a lot, for example how to make lembas, which Milian learned from the Valar Yavanna, Queen of Nature. A while back Finrod got a vision by the Valar Ulmo on his way, which inspired him to build a fortress himself. He already built the tower Minas Tiris at Tol Sirion, where he probably started his journey. When he reached Dorias, he was impressed by the halls of King Thingol, Menegroth, the Thousand Caves, which the dwarves once helped to build. The king told him about a somewhat similar cavern around the river Narok, and so Finrod decided to go there and build his stronghold, which he would call Nargothrond, which means something like vaulted dome or underground fortress of Narok. Galadriel did not come with him and stayed in Dorias with Celeborn. Turgon, the second son of King Fingolfin, who also traveled with his friend Finrod, had a vision by Ulmo too. The vision motivated him to build Gondolin, the hidden city. Some of the famous weapons from Lord of the Rings were made there. Glamdring, the sword of Gandalf, used in the Third Age, was most likely Turgon's sword. Gondolin, which means hidden rock, was built at a hidden place on a hill and kept secret by the elves. Morgoth didn't know about the location for centuries. Both Nargothrond and Gondolin were inspired and to some degree protected by the Valar, both kept secret. Nargothrond grew and its influence expanded to the borders of Palas, where Círdan was still lord, and both realms became close allies. The Noldor also helped rebuilding the neighbor's haven cities. In addition, Finrod raised the tower of Barad Nimras to watch the sea, but Morgoth never used ships. In return, so to say, the marinas of Falas helped to build ships for Nargothrond, 
so they could explore for example the Isle of Balar, planning to build a stronghold and use it as a last stand against Morgos, but it was not Finrod's fate to do so. Under King Fingolfin, the Noldor elves decided to push further against Morgoth. They were victorious in the Dagor Aglareb, the glorious battle where Morgoth sent small bands of orcs deep into Beleriand. The elves hunted the orcs down and Círdan most likely participated in this war, probably foreseeing that it would lead to peace for some time, but he also knew for sure about the dark days that would come after it. After this victory, Fingolfin started to besiege Angband, the fortress of Morgoth, for an impressive 400 years. Angband was built beneath three volcanic mountains called Thangorodrim, which were raised by Morgoth. The elves had not the power to assault Angband directly and tried to contain the evil inside it. During this time, Melian learned about the Silmarilli from Galadriel. As Maya, she was powerful and wise. She knew there was more to the story and foresaw that evil lay upon it. She asked Galadriel further and explained that Thingol should learn about it, but Galadriel answered quite sassy. Quote, Maybe, said Galadriel, but not of me. Melian now understood that the wrath of the Valar lay upon the Noldor and especially Feanor and his sons and that the fate of the Silmarilli was greater than that of the elves and would lead to many terrible wars. She counseled with her husband Thingol and he understood now that the Noldor were not sent by the Valar but came for revenge against the will of the Valar. He also learned that his friend Finwë was slain by Morgoth, which filled him with grief. Círdan heard about this too, which troubled him greatly. His ability to see what happened and will happen urged him to act and so he also sent messages to Thingol and maybe through some rumors that spread in Beleriand, Melian, Thingol and Círdan learned a bit more about what happened once in Aman. When Finrod and his little brother Angrod came to Doriath to visit their sister Galadriel, Thingol confronted the Noldor with what he has learned, especially in the context that their mother is kin to Thingol and Eteleri herself. A very interesting passage in the Silmarillion. I can recommend reading it. Angrod explained that Finarfin's children had no part in the kinslaying and that they were persuaded by Feanor, suffering greatly for it but still holding loyalty to him until now and he spoke bitterly against Feanor's sons, telling Thingol all that happened in Aman. Thingol was shocked but now understood. He announced that the house of Finarfin and Fingolfin is still welcome in Doriath, but the tongue of those who murdered his kin in Aman shall never be heard again in his realm. And all Sindar should never speak the tongue of the Noldor nor answer to it as long as he was king. And who did was considered a traitor and slayer of kin. As a result, most Noldor also abandoned their language Quenya and started to speak Sindarin. That is why Noldor elves will speak Quenya rarely later in Middle-earth and instead use Sindarin. Now men come into play as well. Around first age 310, Galadriel's brother Finrod meets the first men from the house of Beor. As explained, men awoke when the sun first rose in the east of Middle-earth in Hildorian and many went to the west. They split into several houses, usually known as the Three Houses of Men, but it's more complicated. They should also become close allies of the Elves. These men of the Three Houses who went to the West will be known as the Edain or Atani and some of them will also become the Dunedain that we know from Lord of the Rings. Aragorn is related to these men. Edain in Sindarin and Atani in Quenya both mean second people because the elves were the firstborn and first in Beleriand. Finrod is the first who meets the Edain. He looks a bit after them and also teaches them many things. Beor, the leader of one of the houses, serves as a vessel for him until his death. Finrod also arranges where the Edain can settle in Beleriand. However, this is a too complex topic to fit into this video. The arrival of men creates new possibilities and new stories in Beleriand, but it also increases the pressure for Morgoth. In the depths of his fortresses, he created all kinds of evil creatures. His masterpiece are the dragons. Glaurung, the father of dragons, will be the first, as explained in my Dragon Law video. We skip to First Age 455. 
This year will end the peace because Morgoth will break out of the 400 year long siege of the elves in the Dagor Bragolach, the battle of sudden flame. To do this he sent out rivers of flame which burned the land of Ardgalen, which means green region, and killed many of the fleeing elves, followed by his armies of orcs, balrogs and the first dragon Glaurung. It was a disaster for elves and men. Galadriel's brothers Angrod and Aignor died in this battle, but also Hador, the leader of one of the three houses of the Edain. The house of Beor had many casualties too. Not only that, Morgoth now was back in Beleriand again. During this war Finrod would have been killed in an orc ambush, but he was rescued by Barahir from the house of Beor and his men under great losses. Barahir received Finrod's ring as a gift of gratitude, which is of course the ring of Finarfin's house. It will pass down from generation to generation of men and be known as the ring of Barahir, which Aragorn wears in the Lord of the Rings. This makes it clear what line started with Barahir, the line of kings of Arnor and Gondor. In his Ras Fingolfin, the high king of the Noldor else rode to Morgoth and challenged him to a single combat, which sounds like suicide, but Fingolfin was a very powerful elf and he managed to even wound Morgoth seven times, but the Dark Lord was too powerful to be slain. And so the elf king was ultimately defeated by the evil Valar and Tessema Grond. Before he could kill the High King with his foot on his neck, Fingolfin struck his foot one last time, which should make him limp from now on. The corpse of Fingolfin, which Morgoth wanted to feed to his wolves, was rescued by the Lord of the Eagles, Thorondor, who also scratched Morgoth's face in the process. An impressive deed. After Fingolfin's death, his son Fingon would become king and the elves lost complete control of Beleriand's north. Interestingly, Círdan is not mentioned to have participated in this battle, but as a lord of the Sindar it is possible that he could have participated in some way. It must also be considered that his realm was relatively far away and not all places could be reached by ship from the coast. However, the times were dark and troubled in the first age, especially towards its end and the power the elves had to fight were great and the fate was heading to even darker times. Only ten years later the theft of Morgoth's stolen Silmarilli through Barahir son Beren and his future wife Luthien, daughter of Thingol and Melian, brought hope back to the elves, but also in a conflict. I explain this story in my Sauron video. This event is a little turning point and ascends the fate of people over the power of the Silmarilli's curse, especially the half-elven, with exception of the first half-elven I guess, but even he starts a turning point. You can imagine how difficult these times were for the elves because of their inner conflict caused by the kinslaying. We can find the next mention of Círdan when seven years after the battle of sudden flame Fingon, now the high king of the Noldor elves, fought against hosts from Angband in Hithlum. As mentioned the elves lost control of the north and Morgoth forces pressured the borders. It looked not good for Fingon and he was outnumbered, but Círdan with his foresight sent ships over the furs of Drengist and turned the loss into a victory for the elves, saving Fingon. I think this event is a little turning point on how Círdan is mentioned. He seems to become a bit more active or maybe his deeds are simply more often mentioned in the Silmarillion from now on. It must also be considered that many royal elves died in the battles before and probably the focus was now more on him because there were not many left anymore. The elves also had to move closer to the shores and seek refuge in Círdan's realm Falas, but also in Nargothrond under Finrod. Gondolin remained secret and shut. Still Círdan is a very passive character because he is more the elf in the background. Nonetheless Morgoth's forces became stronger and so Feanor's son Maithros planned to form a giant alliance with all enemies of Morgoth, the union of Maithros. With this he wanted to create a powerful army to push the Dark Lord back to Angband. However some else like Thingol and even Finrod's successor Orodres, still having in mind the deeds of Feanor and his sons sent only few. Two of Feanor's sons even openly declared their intent to slay Thingol and his people. 
One of them was the father of Celebrimbor, the ringmaker from the Second Age. His name was Kurufin. However, with the dwarves from Belegost and Nogrod, the Edain and the Noldor, with Gondolin sending a huge host, they still had an impressive army. Also, new men arrived in Beleriand, the Easterlings under Ulfang and Bor, and joined the Union too. In the meantime, or let's say a bit earlier, the two mentioned sons of Theanor, namely Kelegorm and Kurufin, kidnapped Thingol's daughter Luthien. She could escape and joined Beren's quest to retrieve the Silmarilli from Morgos, in which Finrod died, fulfilling his oath to Barahir by protecting his son Beren. Beren and Lucien managed to get one Silmaril back, but Beren and later Lucien died in the process. I talked earlier about half elven and that this event would start ascending over the power of the Silmarilli's curse. This story is a first step because both Lucien and Beren got a new life after their death and they had a child, the first half elven Dior, who would make the next step. But back to the Union. It happened that Morgoth was allied with some of the Easterlings in secret, promising them good land in Beleriand. Ulfang and his Easterlings betrayed the Union, leaking the battle plan to Morgoth. Bor should later be known as the Faithful, so he and his people did not betray the Union. And so the battle began that would be known as the Nirnais Arnödiad, the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. The name was related to the first line of Mandos prophecy, which prophetized unnumbered tears for the elves. As the name already implies, it was a disaster for the Union, even though they came really close to defending Morgoth's forces. In the end, it was not enough. The betrayal of Ulfang, who actively turned against the Union in battle, was a big part of it, but also the power of Glaurung. Many Edain and also Bor and his Easterlings, but also the dwarves of Belegos, defended and hold against Morgoth, host of orcs, trolls, Balrogs and Glaurung under great sacrifices to allow the others, including the elves, to retreat. Some of the houses of the Edain got almost wiped out and Bor died too. The dwarves had heavy casualties and their lord was slain by Glaurung, but he wounded the dragon too, that he had to flee from battle. Same with the elves, who for example lost their high king Fingon. On the other side, Morgos had massive losses as well, and Ulfang and his sons were slain, but it was nothing compared to what the Union lost. Some stories, especially the children of Hurin, are related to this battle. I explain it in my Dragon Law video in the Glaurung section. The fate of Hurin, who fought in this battle, is devastating, as he was captured by Morgoth and should later become some kind of doombringer, leading to Gondolin's and Doria's destruction. It is not known if Círdan participated in the battle, but he would be involved in the aftermath. After such a heavy loss, the peoples of Beleriand had to flee. Gondolin, which was still hidden, gave many refuge. Also, Doriath was still there, because it was protected by the girdle of Melian. The realms closer to the coast, like the still hidden Nargothrond and especially Falas under Círdan, took many refugees as well. Círdan tried to fight a bit and harried the enemy with swift landings, but Morgos at least knew about Falas and prepared a powerful attack, because he was planning to destroy all realms of the elves. Through the Silmarilli, the evil deeds of some of the elves, the oaths of Feanor and the tragic events around Húrin and his children, fate itself was against them. Morgoth besieged the big cities of Falas, Brisombar and Eglarest with powerful siege worms. And even though the walls of the cities were strong, he breached through and slew or enslaved everyone that could not escape by ship. The ships under the command of Círdan sailed with the survivors to the Isle of Balar. Among those survivors was also Gilgalad. In the Silmarillion he is a son of Fingon, but that's an editorial mistake. He is the son of Orodreth, the successor of Finrod in Nargothrond, and with this related to Galadriel's or Finarfin's family. Círdan took care of him and built a refuge on the Isle of Balar for all the survivors and those who could flee from Morgoth's forces and reach the island. Because of many people fleeing to the shores and not enough ships, the shipwright could not abandon Beleriand's mainland completely and he built a secret haven at the mouth of Sirion, where he hid many light and swift ships in the creeks and waters where the reeds were dense as a forest.
Morgoth, on the other hand, now controlled big parts of Beleriand. Only the few mentioned places were not under his control. Turgon, who was now High King of the Noldor Elves, sought counsel with Círdan and asked him to build swift ships so that they could sail to Aman and call for help. The shipwright built those ships, but on their way to the west a mighty storm came and sunk them, because the Noldor were still banned from Aman. Only one messenger, named Voronwe, was saved by Ulmo and washed ashore. There he met a man called Tuor, the grandfather of Elrond, who was also a messenger of Ulmo and the nephew of the cursed Húrin. Voronwe, who knew the hidden city's location, went with him to Gondolin so that he could deliver Ulmo's message. We can also read in the Unfinished Tales that Morgoth feared the raids of Círdan's ship, which probably made the coast region somewhat safe and possibly helped Tuor and Voronwe on parts of their journey. Speaking of Húrin, as mentioned, he was imprisoned by Morgoth after the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. The Dark Lord cursed him and his children because he dared to mock the evil Valar, but also because he fought ferociously in the battle until his axe withered and he was buried under the corpses of the enemies he slew. Part of Morgoth's cruel punishment was that he had to watch how Morgoth's curse led to the doom of his children. As mentioned, I explain this story in more detail in my Glaurung section of my Dragon Law video. The narrative is very similar to the story of Kulervo from the Finnish national epic Kalevala, but has also similarities with Oedipus and Sigurd the Volsung. Here the short version. Hurin had a son named Turin, who had a very difficult life. A reason for this was that Morgoth, after the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, betrayed the Easterlings, who also had betrayed the Elves and Edain in this battle. The evil Valar promised them rich lands, but instead bent them to Hislum, where Turin was born and lived with his mother. Morgoth demanded now from the Easterlings that they terrorize this land, murder and plunder the remaining old women and children of the house of Hador living there. It's one of the three houses of the Edain, which Hurin was the leader of. So a tough life for those people, but Turin's mother sent her son to Dorias, where Hurin was remembered as a hero who fought ferociously and helped the elf retreat. He was even accepted by a son by Thingol for the deeds of his father. But one day in an accident, Turin killed one of the counselors of the king and fled. As explained, the once beautiful Beleriand was now under Morgoth's control, so it was not safe and small bands of outlaws formed either to plunder, to survive or to fight against the orcs in a hit and run tactic. Turin joined one, but through various events of fates he landed in Nargothrond, not revealing his parentage. After Finrod's death in Beren's arms during his quest for the Silmarilli, Orodres ruled over it. Turin's identity did not stay hidden for long and when the elves learned who he was, he got promoted to counselor because, as mentioned, Hurin was a great hero for the elves. But this also brought Morgoth's curse over Nargothrond. Through Turin's advice, Orodres abandoned the strategy of secrecy, so hiding Nargothrond's location and hidden run attacks. Instead, they even built a bridge and fought battles in the open field, with success. They managed to drive Morgoth's forces out of their land. Despite their success, the Valar Ulmo and Círdan foresaw Nargothron's doom. Ulmo advised to contact them and so the shipwright sent two messages to Orodres warning him of what will come and that they should destroy the bridge as soon as possible. Círdan and his messengers really tried but in the end Nargothrond did not listen because Túrin would not change his mind and his word was trusted. And so Morgoth Ras came upon them in the form of Glaurung, father of dragons. With a powerful host, the dragon devastated Nargothrond and enslaved or murdered its citizens, taking their treasures as his hoard. Only Túrin survived because Glaurung saw his curse and had worse in mind, which led to Túrin's and his sister's suicide, but Glaurung's death too. With the dragon's death, the horde became free, including a necklace called Nauglamir, which was once made by the dwarf for Finrod, Galadriel's brother. It was very beautiful and precious. With the fall of Nargothrond, only Gondolin, Dorias, the mouse of Sirion, and Balar and Akirdan, the dwarven cities, and probably the elves in Osiriand were left. Dorias would be next. As explained, once Silmaril was recovered by the men Beren and Thingol's and Melian's daughter Luthien and brought to Dorias. 
The Silmaril would bring its curse over it. Melian warned Thingol, but he became obsessed with the jewel. One day Hurin found the Nauglamir in Nargosrond and brought it to the king. He threw it in anger to his feet and left Doriath. Thingol took it and had an idea. He invited dwarfs who worked for him in the past and asked them to combine the Silmaril with the Nauglamir. It should become the most beautiful work of the first age and ages to come. The dwarves greatly desired the necklace and so did the king. They demanded it as their reward, but Thingol refused and planned to send the dwarves home without payment, which led to a strife resulting in Thingol's death. The aftermath of this event led to revenge upon revenge. This is also the reason why elves, especially Sindar and dwarves, should often have a bad relationship and distrust each other in the future. The Sindar Legolas and Gimli should be a very special exception and probably change this after the War of the Ring 6500 years later. After Thingol's death Melian left Middle Earth and so the girdle of Melian did not protect the kingdom anymore. Her daughter Luthien had a son with Beren named Dior, the first half-elven, who also became Doriath's next king. From his mother Luthien he later inherited the Silmaril and Nauglamir, which Beren once returned from the dwarves by killing their host that ravaged Doriath, ending the cycle of revenge. The retrieval happened during Luthien's and Beren's second life. Both seem to be above the power of the curse in this time. However, the curse was brought over Dior and Doriath when he got the Silmaril necklace. When the seven sons of Feanor learned about the Silmaril in the unprotected Doriath, they attacked. As the son of Beren and Luthien, Dior was very powerful and slew three of the seven sons, but died in the process too. This would also change the balance of power and the pass of the curse a bit. The remaining sons of Feanor slew his wife and left their two seven-year-old twin sons in the forest to starve. Only his daughter Elwing escaped with the Silmaril and the necklace. This event should be known as the second kinslaying. After it Dorias was abandoned. These heavy events should also scar the remaining sons a bit. They were still driven by their oath, but knew how cruel they have become. We can read that the oldest of Feanor's sons Maithros repented and searched in the forest for the twin sons of Dior, but he could not find them. Their fate is unknown, but they most likely died. Elwing however made it somehow to the havens of Sirion. She was about four years old at this point. There she grew up, I assume under the eye of Círdan. She was half-elven too and later met another half-elven Earendil. Earendil is the son of the mentioned Tuor, who was on his way to Gondolin as a messenger of Ulmo and founded thanks to Voronwe. In Gondolin Tuor met Idril, daughter of Turgon, the now high king of the Noldor elves. They fell in love and had a son, Earendil, the father of Elrond. And you guessed it right, Elwing is of course the mother of Elrond. But how did Earendil come to the mouth of Sirion? He grew up in Gondolin. His father had a message for its king Turgon from the Valar Ulmo. Abandon the city or you are doomed. Through various events the king didn't listen. As explained earlier, after Hurin had seen the deaths of his children, Morgoth set him free and he became like a doombringer. Where he went bad things happened. He searched for his friend Turgon in Gondolin, who out of fear of his curse did not answer his call. This was chronologically before Hurin went to Nargothrond, finding the Nauglamir. However, not answering Hurin's call didn't protect Gondolin, because with this Morgoth learned where he had to look for the hidden city, even though he did not get the exact position. In the end, the orcs managed to capture an elf from Gondolin, who would betray the hidden city and reveal its position out of various motives. A topic for another video. When Morgoth finally learned the location of the hidden city, he sent a powerful army of orcs, balrogs and dragons. Turgon got slain or buried under debris. Only few escaped through Idril's secret tunnel and thanks to the noble sacrifices of Ecthelion and Glorfindel, who both managed to slay a balrog. Ecthelion actually even slew Gosmok himself. It was still a disaster. Under the survivors were Idril, Tuor and Earendil, who fled to the mouth of Sirion, becoming leaders there because Círdan was busy in Balar. 
And so Gondolin was lost and Morgoth's forces probably plundered the city which must be connected to how Glamdring, Orchrist and Sting came into the horde of the trolls in The Hobbit. But the exact path to this place is not known. In this context it makes sense to some degree that the great goblin in The Hobbit recognizes Thorin's weapon because some weapons from the first age could have become known and feared in goblin or orc lore. With Gondolin destroyed only Balar and the mouth of Sirion were left as main cities of the elves. Círdan took Erendil as apprentice and helped him build his ship Vingilote and it was identical to the ship in Círdan's vision from the beginning when he got his foresight. It is very important that Círdan teaches and helps Erendil building this ship because with this the curse of the Silmaril will finally reach Morgoth himself. I assume Círdan's immense knowledge about shipbuilding that he gathered over the last 4000 years helped building a ship able to reach Aman too. If we remember the beginning of the video it was always Círdan's greatest desire to get there and see its light. Of course Erendil also marries Elwing and they have twin sons, the half elven Elrond and Elros. In those two all elven lines, the lines of the Edain and even the blood of Amaya are united. They are very special. If you ask yourself where the Vanyar line is from, it's from Idril's mother who died on the Arctic journey from Amman to Middle Earth. Seeing the hopeless situation against Morgos, Erendil decided to sail west with his mighty ship to ask the Valar in Valinor for help. But the wind still repelled him and he could not reach Aman, so he started to return to Middle Earth. Elwing still had the Silmaril and so its curse came upon the mouth of Sirion. The remaining four sons of Feanor never gave up to find it and learned where the Silmaril was. There were not many places left to be honest but this time the sons were a bit hesitant at first. They knew what they have done so far and asked or let's say demanded the Silmaril before starting to kill everyone which is an improvement on their path of madness but the people around the mouth of Sirion saw the jewel as a blessing and did not want to give it away. And this should start the third kinslaying. Feanor's sons sacked the mouth of Sirion. Círdan and Gilgalad were late sending their fleets to aid the elves there. I assume the curse of the Silmaril was probably greater than even Círdan's foresight. Also Erendil was not back in time. The battle is described as the cruelest of the kinslayings because they attacked basically a small camp where elves lived fleeing from a terrible war. I assume that still some powerful lords of the elves lived there too because two of Feanor's sons were slain in battle. To escape Elwing cast herself with the Silmaril necklace into the sea. However Maglor, one of the last two remaining sons of Feanor could not slay her twin sons and took them captive. He would raise them from now on and become their foster father. They even later developed a good relationship considering the circumstances. An interesting detail as Elrond later becomes a foster father for Aragorn too. Actually a lot of young Dúnedain chieftains spent their childhood in Rivendell. I can imagine that this childhood event shaped Elrond's hospitality. However Elwing was not dead. Ulmo saved her by transforming her into a white bird with a Silmaril and she flew over the sea until she reached her husband's ship exhausted who caught her when she fell on the ship. There overnight she transformed back and of course still had the Silmaril and the necklace with her. In their despair over the situation potentially losing their children they saw no hope in Middle Earth and decided to try sailing to Amman once more. And this decision would change everything. The two half elven were not repelled by the wind this time, passed the enchanted isles and reached Amman. Their story convinced the Valar to send help but they also demanded that Elwing and Earendil as half elven must decide what they want to be, men or elf. Elwing decided to be an elf and Earendil too for sake of his wife. This is an interesting detail because men were not allowed to enter Amman. The Valar with probably the mightiest army ever seen came to Middle Earth to defeat Morgoth and so the war of Ras began. Not much is known about Círdan's role in this war but as a lord of the elves and as one who gave many elves refuge or helped them escape he most likely had some involvement. Same with young Elros and Elrond. I assume a lot of people who could still fight from Beleriand were involved. 
the concept of the elf in the background goes through all of Círdan's life. In Amman, Earendil's ship was blessed by the Valar and he wore on his brow the Silmaril and Nauglamir he got from his wife. In this form you could say he ascended to another level and his ship could be seen as a star in the sky, as seen in the vision of Círdan. His wife Elwing remained in Amman but he flew on his ship to Middle Earth and slew the mightiest of Morgoth's dragons, Ancalagon the Black, who buried the three volcanic mountaintops of Thangorodrim under him when he fell down to Earth. The mighty forces clashing in the War of Wrath would finally lead to the destruction of Beleriand and ultimately sink it into the ocean. In the end Morgoth was defeated, captured and bent into the void. Sauron however could escape and so the second age of the years of the sun began. The two remaining sons of Feanor would violently steal the last two recovered Silmarilli from the Valar or their banner bearer the Maya Eonwe to be precise, who let them have it because he knew that they could not hold them. The Silmarilli burned their hands and in despair Maithros cast himself and his Silmaril into a fiery chasm and Maglor, Elrond's foster father, threw his Silmaril into the ocean, wandering the shores forever in despair. With this the jewels were in sky, earth and water and all sons of Feanor dead except for Maglor. The oath became a curse and finally their doom. Círdan stood loyal to the Valar and accepted to stay in Middle Earth. He would serve under Gilgalad, the new high king of the Noldor elves, who he protected together with Elrond, who became Gilgalad's herald and decided to be numbered among the elves. Elros would decide to be men and sail with his people to an island made for them as a gift by the Valar called Elena, which means Star Wars, because the star of Earendil showed them the way. The kingdom should be known as Númenor. This is where the Dún Edain lived. What's interesting is that these Edain were no mariners, so they used the elven ships of Círdan, who also assigned elf mariners to them, so they could captain the ships with the Edain to Númenor. The elves left some ships in Númenor but sailed with the majority back to Middle Earth. Círdan also taught the Edain a bit of shipbuilding and on Númenor they slowly improved this art. It should take 600 years until the Dún Edain would send the first ship back to Middle Earth and it was captained by a man called Veantur. It reached Mislon, the Grey Havens. With this Númenor focused on seafaring and they became great mariners but also built small settlements in Middle Earth. Second Age 725, the king of Númenor allowed his son to sail to Middle Earth with his grandfather Veantur. They sailed together to Mislond and were welcomed by Círdan and Gilgalad. This implies that Círdan probably never visited Númenor himself, which makes sense because he should stay in Middle Earth. However, he did send ships to the kingdom of the Dúnedain and even to Amman. The Númenorians and elves in Lindon had a good relationship. How intense depended on the current ruler's politics. Gilgalad also warned Númenor of a rising dark power in the east, meaning Sauron. So you can see how important seafaring at this time was. It was not just helping the elves to return to Amman, but also diplomacy between the elves and men. We are now coming to more familiar lore. In the meantime Sauron established himself in Mordor and seeing the might of his enemies including Númenor, he started to build his fortress Barad-dûr. During this time he also created his vicious plan. He took a fair form calling himself Anatar, Lord of Gifts and visited the elves. He pretended to be an ambassador from Amman sent by the Valar for shattering the rival of the Istari. As gift he wanted to teach the elves how to forge magical rings, the rings of power. He first visited Gil-galad but the king Elrond and I assume Círdan doubted him, a wise decision. Sauron was however more successful in Eregion, the other big realm of the Noldor elves in Middle Earth, which was ruled by Celebrimbor. We can see its ruins in the first Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings film, they are also mentioned in the books. Sauron convinced them against the advice of Galadriel who lived in Eregion with her husband Celeborn at this time. The couple actually founded Eregion with Celebrimbor and later left for Los Lorien. I assume Lindon also advised Celebrimbor against trusting this ambassador. They did not know it was Sauron though.
Kelly Brimbor and his jewels missing guild, the Guais Ymir Dain, believed Sauron and forged the 16 rings of power and other minor rings with Sauron's help. Kelly Brimbor also made his masterpieces, the three elven rings of power, Vilja, Narya and Nenya in secret, still using Sauron's vicious design, but without him knowing or observing the process. I explained this part of the story in many other videos in much detail, so we skip a bit through it. Kili Brimbor also gifted one ring of power most likely to Durin the Third, the king of Khazad Dum, which will later be known as Moria. Eregion and the dwarves of Khazad Dum had a very good relationship and even worked together, like the dwarves and Thingol ones, although parts of the surviving dwarf from Beleriand fled to Khazad Dum. I would assume their conflict was probably more focused on the Sindar and Celebrimbor was a Noldor elf. In addition, Eregion was founded Second Age 700 by Galadriel and Celeborn, so a lot of time has passed and none of the original dwarves from Beleriand were still alive at this time. Now Sauron's plan was to dominate the elves by creating a master ring to all the rings of power, the One Ring, which he forged alone in the fires of Mount Doom in Mordor, putting his will and much of his power into it. Interestingly, there are some First Age parallels, just a bit reverted. Mount Doom was once created by Morgoth, so you could say this place combined the old evil and the new evil of Middle-earth, creating a world-changing artifact that would bring doom again over Middle-earth, like the Silmarilli ones, but this time it was created by the evil. On the other side, we find a bit of Morgoth old foe Fëanor in this, because Celebrimbor is his grandson, who will become a tragic figure in history. While in the first age, the doom-bringing artifact was created by the elves and desired by evil, it is now partially the other way around, at least later in history, and with exception of the rings of power, but they are just devices for domination through the One Ring and Sauron. However, there is another big difference we come to in a moment. The One Ring was created around Second Age 1600, about the time when the 600 year long construction of his fortress Barad Dur was completed. But it seems Sauron underestimated the elves. When he put the One Ring on his finger to dominate them, the elves could see through his plans and took the rings of power from their fingers. Sauron was not amused, but still on one of his peaks of power, he gathered a mighty army and invaded Eregion starting the War of the Elves and Sauron. The dwarves together with the elf from Lothlorien tried to help but got pushed back into Khazad Doom, forcing them to close Durin's door. Gilgalad called Númenor for help and sent Elrond with an army to help Eregion. But Elrond got defeated and narrowly escaped to the north thanks to the attack of the dwarves and Lothlorien. There he established a stronghold which should later become Rivendell. Interestingly, according to Tolkien's later writings, Glorfindel was sent by the Valar to help Elrond, but also the first two Istari, the Blue Wizards, arrived with him at this time. In addition, calling for Númenor so early was very wise by Gilgalad, and I assume that Círdan had to do with it too, because it were most likely his ships who delivered the message, and with his foresight, his counsel was for sure meaningful for Gil-galad, but it's not explicitly mentioned. With Eregion's destruction, Sauron controlled almost all of Eriador and basically Middle-earth, except for the Misty Mountains, Los Lorien, Rivendell and Lindon, where Mislon the Grey Havens lie. He captured Celebrimbor and collected all the rings of power, except for the three elven ones and the one in Durin's possession. And here we come to the mentioned big difference compared to the Silmarilli. Celebrimbor did not have the by any means necessary attitude of his grandfather. He also did not follow him and his oath. He was wise and after seeing his mistake when Sauron put on his one ring, he hid the three elven rings and even sought counsel with Galadriel, who wandered through Khazad Doom to Lothlorien, far before the sack of Eregion. Both Noldor had not the strength to destroy the rings, so they decided to hide them. One ring of power, Nenya, he gave to her, and the other two, Vilja and Narya, he sent to Gilgalad, who gave Narya to Círdan. When Sauron captured Celebrimbor, he would not reveal to him under torture where he hid the last three rings, which were also the most powerful of the 19 rings. 
would Sauron got his hands on them, history would be different and probably unfolded a devastating doom as the Silmarilli did in Beleriand which was destroyed in the end. Sauron put Celebrimbor to death and his orcs carried him on a pole like a banner through Eregion. The Dark Lord now changed his plan from controlling the elves to destroying them. He made his way through Eriador and the people living there had to flee, but his armies were weakened because he had to split a part of it to contain Elrond in Rivendell. This dark time would be known as the Days of Flight because many fled to Lindon which was pretty much the last safe place. The rest of the Second Age would be known as the Dark Years because Sauron was very dominant for long time periods. The war looked not good for the elves over the years, especially when Sauron pushed Gilgalad's and Círdan's forces over the river Hlun, 2nd age 1700, but after a long delay the mighty forces of the Dúnedain, the Westmen from Númenor, finally arrived and turned the loss into a victory. Sauron narrowly escaped with only few bodyguards and returned to Mordor, but all his forces were slain. You could think a devastating loss, which it was, but Sauron's position was still very good. All other factions had devastating losses too and Eriador was in ruins. In addition, Sauron was not contested in the east and could rebuild his strengths. Gondor did not exist yet. Back at home he swore revenge against Númenor. After Sauron's defeat the elves formed the first white council. It is not known who the exact members were except for Gilgalad and probably Elrond but I would assume Galadriel and Círdan were members too. The council decided that Rivendell would become the new elvish realm of Eriador and the ruined Eregon would not be rebuilt. During the council and probably related to Elrond becoming the lord of Rivendell, Gilgalad gave his ring Vilia to his herald, becoming his vice regent in Eriador. Also the Numenorians would establish more settlements and harbors, but over time they should develop a slowly increasing fear of death, later even neglecting their relationship to the elves a bit, becoming very proud and doing their own thing, which Sauron would later exploit. Around 2nd age 2251 the Nazgul appeared the first time, but not much is known on what they did. The next centuries should be relatively calm until Sauron taunted Númenor and they sent one of the most powerful fleets and armies ever seen on Middle Earth to Mordor. Sauron got captured and brought as a prisoner to Númenor. However, Sauron planned to be captured as it was part of his revenge. I have explained this story in my other videos in detail, so I skip a bit through it. Sauron used his abilities to manipulate the king and advance from prisoner to advisor of the king and later even to something like the high priest of Morgos or even a god on the island. With this Númenor went to madness and Sauron convinced their king Arpharazon to send a gigantic fleet to Amman claiming immortality from the Valar. Of course men were not allowed to enter Amman. This led to the destruction of Númenor and the destruction of the fleet by Eru which is God and to reshaping of the world which moved Amman to the unseen realm. Sauron's body was destroyed with Númenor but his spirit returned to Mordor and he was never able again to take a fair form. But not all Númenóreans died. A small group called the Faithful who did not worship Morgos and Sauron escaped on ships with the Palantiri, the Ring of Barahir and a seedling of the White Tree. They were led by Elendil, Isildur's father. Isildur and his brother Anarion were also on these ships. In Middle-earth they should found the Dúnedain kingdoms in exile, Arnor ruled by Elendil and Gondor ruled by Isildur and Anarion. This is the short version. For completeness sake also some of the kingsmen following Sauron living in Middle-earth at the time of destruction survived too. They are called Black Numenorians. In the meantime Sauron needed most likely some time to take a physical form again. He was quite angry that some Numenorians survived and established a kingdom quite next to Mordor. So he attacked them which took them by surprise because they thought Sauron was dead too. When Elendil heard about the attacks on Gondor and counseled with Isildur he formed an alliance with Gil-galad and his realm including Círdan and Elrond to end Sauron once and for all. The last alliance of elves and men. Arnor's and Lindon's forces met at Amon Sul or later known as the Weathertop. 
marching to Rivendell over the Misty Mountains and down to Mordor. Even the elf from Lothlorien under Amdir and the sylvan elves under Thranduil's father Orofer join, but also the dwarves from Khazad Doom under Durin the Fourth. Sauron tried to delay them by burning the forests on their path, which should become known as Brownlands after that. The Entwives lived in those forests. Anarion managed to hold Osgiliath against Sauron's forces in the meantime, but was in dire need. When the last alliance arrived and united with the remaining forces of Gondor, they started to march toward the Black Gate, where Sauron's forces were waiting. Amdir, the king of Lothlorien, and Thranduil's father Orofer, king of the Sylvan Elves from Amon Lang, as proud Sindar did not want to be under Gilgalad's command, probably because of what the Noldor did to the Teleri in the past. They charged alone against Sauron and got utterly defeated. Both kings died and Amdir and his forces were driven into the swamp area that would be known as the Dead Marshes, where they were cut off from the main forces and perished. Thranduil, however, survived and led the remaining forces of the Sylvan Elves for the rest of the war and became their next king. It must be noted that not all Sindar thought this way, because, for example, Gilgalad's forces, but also his realm, consisted of Noldor and Sindar Elves. After months of battle, the last alliance defeated Sauron's forces and pushed through the Black Gate, while Sauron retreated, and so the siege of the almost indestructible fortress Barad-dûr, the Dark Tower, began and took seven years. During this siege, Isildur's brother Anarion was killed. After those seven years, Sauron came forth with a mighty host and tried to break the siege. Círdan and Elrond fought alongside Gil-galad and Elendil. We can see Círdan's banner in the first film's prologue, a nice reference. The two kings fought Sauron directly, but the Dark Lord was too powerful and killed both, breaking Elendil's sword Narsil, but was thrown down too. Isildur now cut off Sauron's finger with a one ring using the broken hilt shard of his father's powerful sword, defeating Sauron under great losses. However, Sauron's spirit left his body and hid in the Far East. Now Círdan and Elrond counseled Isildur to throw the One Ring into the fires of Mount Doom to diminish Sauron to just a shadow, so he would never be able to recover. But Isildur could not do it and ignored their counsel. He wanted to keep the ring as a tribute to his losses and as an heirloom, and so the path for Sauron's return was not shut. This ended the Second Age and many thought Sauron was defeated once and for all, but the wise like Círdan and Elrond knew otherwise. And this leads us to Círdan's greatest deed. The Third Age started not so well, when Isildur and three of his four sons died in the disaster of the Gladden Fields, where also the One Ring was lost. In addition, Elrond refused to become the next High King of the Noldor Elves. You could argue that Galadriel could have claimed this position too, but she did not and so the Noldor Elves had no king and I assume Círdan became Lord over Lindon. Beyond that, the first 500 years of the Third Age were quite peaceful, until Gondor was invaded by the Easterlings for the first time, which is not a coincidence, because that is where Sauron dwelt and where he formed new alliances with the Easterlings, who probably also fought on his side during the War of the Last Alliance. The activities and Sauron's potential to return was not hidden to the wise and powerful. And so the other three Istari, first Saruman, then Gandalf and Radagast, arrived around 3rd age 1000. In this context, it's also interesting that Saruman first travels to the Far East. I could imagine counseling with the two blue wizards whose mission was there. When Gandalf and Radagast reached Middle-earth, they arrived in Mislond, the Grey Havens. Círdan welcomed them and as the only one could see through their disguise as old men and see their true nature as Mayar from Aman. Not only that, he chose Gandalf and gave him his elven ring of power Narya as a gift, probably his greatest deed, because it could rekindle the hearts of others in dark times, a thing Gandalf does a lot with the words that almost seem like a prophecy, but describe Círdan and his power very well, who is often far more passive, but nonetheless important. Take now this ring, he said, for thy labors and thy cares will be heavy, but in all it will support thee and defend thee from weariness. For this is a ring of fire, 
and herewith maybe thou shalt rekindle hearts to the valor of old in a world that goes chill. But as for me, my heart is with the sea, and I will dwell by the grey shores guarding the havens until the last ship sails. Then I shall await thee. If you go through the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings and count how many times Gandalf does this, it becomes clear that this was one of the wisest choices in the history of the Third Age. Not to imagine what happened if he would have gifted it to Saruman or kept it. I think this also explains what the actual difference between the elven rings of power and the others are. The design is very similar and most beings can only wear the three rings when Sauron does not wear the one ring, else he could manage to dominate them, but Sauron's doom does not lie upon them. While the other rings of power always led into death and despair for those who wore them, the three elven rings did not and could be used to ultimately defeat Sauron. The Nine Rings turned mighty men into Nazgul. The dwarven bearers of the Seven Ring all found their doom in wars and fights against the dragons, which are creatures of Morgoth, were slain by a Balrog, which will be known as Durin's Bane, a servant of Morgoth too, or got captured by Sauron, Morgoth's greatest servant, and put to death by him in his dungeons of Dol Guldur. Probably all deaths were related to their increased greed by the Seven Rings. I also like how the remains of Morgoth are involved in this. Only the three elf rings are not affected, which explains what not touched by Sauron means and how Sauron's power allowed him to forge fate. It's hard to imagine what would have happened if Sauron got his hands on the three rings too. He probably would have brought doom over the elvish wise and Frodo would have had no place to hide. But of course, it's not only Círdan's ring, but also the work of the Istari, which also came to an interesting time because 3rd age 1050, a shadow went over Greenwood the Great, which was renamed into Mirkwood for all the strange and dark things happened there. This must have been very bad because Thranduil had to abandon his capital in Amon Lang, the Naked Hill, and find a new place for his people, which will be very far away. He built his new realm in the far north of Mirkwood and his abandoned old fortress became known as Dol Guldur, the Hill of Sorcery. And with this, Sauron is back in Middle-earth, hiding there as a necromancer, and the wise became very slowly concerned. What most likely drew their focus away was the development in Arnor. After Elendil's death in the War of the Last Alliance, Isildur ruled over his father's kingdom Arnor and let his brother's son rule over Gondor. I explain this more detailed in my Aragorn video. When King Earendur died, third age 861, his son set dissensions about the heritage and split Arnor into three kingdoms. This decision and the dissensions would weaken them. Even though Sauron was still not back from the east at that time, his servants became more and more active and the leader of the Nazgul would use this chance to establish his realm Angmar in the north, becoming the Witch King of Angmar. The Dúnedain line in one of these three kingdoms called Chudaur would also become weaker, especially under the pressure of Angmar, troubling the people there. Hillmen would take over the rule, who were then allied with the Witch King, which led to wars. It's very interesting that these conflicts caused some Stur hobbits, ancestors of Gollum, to move over the misty mountains to the Gladden Fields, where the One Ring would be found later. However, the war with Angmar continued for centuries in this region, even pressuring Rivendell, which obviously didn't happen unnoticed. It can be assumed that the eyes of the wise were directed towards this conflict, but also towards Gondor's conflicts with the Easterlings Umbar and the Haradrim, even though Gondor was doing well. There was a lot going on during this time. It becomes clear that Sauron chose a good point in time to come back in secret, with the inner conflicts in Arnor and later Angmar pulling the attention of the wise towards them. You could also interpret the situation of abandoning Amon Lang as Thranduil's kingdom being very isolated. It seems nobody cared or all were busy with other conflicts. We can find a note that Lindon and Círdan helped Arafor, king of one of the mentioned three kingdoms called Arthedain, to repel the enemy from their capital Fornost and surroundings. So it becomes clear that the elf from this region cared and also intervened. 
In parallel, Gondor during this time was facing a huge inner conflict called the Kinstrife and could not help. This was followed by the Great Plague, of which some assume that its spread was Sauron's doing. This also led to Gondor abandoning their outposts in Mordor. The Great Plague would reach the remains of Arnor as well and trouble them heavily. Combined with attacks of Angmar and the summoning of the Barrow Whites by the Witch King, which are evil spirits that infested the Barrow Downs, another kingdom of the three called Cardolan was lost and their realm even became unpopulated. So only Arthedain was left of the three kingdoms. When Arvedui, which means last king, ruled, Angmar managed to conquer their capital Fornost. He and the remaining Dunedain had to flee. Gondor was also in deep trouble due to a coordinated attack of the Haradrim from the south and the Easterlings from the east. Arvedui fled with some of his people into the far and cold north, hiding in old dwarven mines in the Blue Mountains with several heirlooms like Tupalantiri and the Ring of Barahir. They almost died to hunger but were aided by the Lossos, the snowmen of Forochel. This winter was also exceptionally cold and long. The king's son, who was not with his father, contacted Círdan and told him about his father's flight into the north and so the shipwright prepared a ship to rescue him. The ship reached Arvedui and he gave the ring of Barahir as a token of his gratitude to the snowman, which should be later recovered by Elrond. The snowman feared the elven ship, a thing they had never seen before. They also felt a bad omen in the wind and warned Arvedui not to go, but the king did not listen. The ship should sink on the journey back with the king dying in the cold water. The two Palantiri were on the ship too and lost forever. I always interpret this story as Círdan trying hard, but he is not powerful enough to overcome the fate that lies upon others. It was a prophecy that gave Arvedui his name, last king, and he was the last king of Arthedain because it was completely destroyed by Angmar and Arnor was no more. Círdan had information and the foresight to send a ship able to find and reach the king, but not to bring him back alive. His son, who was not with his father and survived, decided to not call himself king and became the first chieftain of the Dúnedain, a title that much later Aragorn, who is from this line, would inherit. In the meantime, Gondor, southern army managed to defeat the Haradrim, but the eastern forces were defeated, even losing their king. The army from the south returned to Gondor and surprised the already celebrating Easterlings, utterly defeating them. After this, the new king of Gondor sent his son to Arnor to help the Arthedain, but he was too late. Gondor's army arrived in the havens and united with the elvish armies from Lindon under Círdan. Círdan summoned everyone that could fight, be it men or elf, to join the army and they marched east to Fornost. Even the hobbits sent bowmen. The witch king only moved a part of his army to confront them early instead of fighting in the city, which was probably a mistake. Angmar's forces got defeated and retreated to Karn Doom, the witch king's capital and chief fortress in the far north. There Glorfindel, with an army from Rivendell, joined the fight too and utterly destroyed Angmar. As explained in the Aragorn video, it is also here where Glorfindel makes the witch king prophecy and not by the hand of men will he fall. Even though Círdan could not save Arnor, he at least could destroy Angmar and cleanse the land. Arvedui's son probably found refuge for some time in his realm, saving the line of Isildur. Many men fled to Lindon during the war with Angmar, a parallel to the First Age and Falas. With one difference, the Dark Lord could not destroy Círdan's realm this time. And with this he created the foundation of what will later be the fall of Sauron, even though the result of the wars were devastating at this time. Sauron and his servants now focused on Gondor, killed their king and took Minas Ithil and its Palantir, transforming the city into Minas Morgul, the new realm of the Witch King, neglecting Eriador. In the meantime, Gandalf investigated Dol Guldur, 3rd age 2063, resulting in Sauron leaving Dol Guldur to hide in the east for another 400 years. He was still too weak to reveal himself. 
Abandoning Dol Guldur led to Gandalf not be able to find out who the necromancer really was at this time. These 400 years were relatively quiet and peaceful and were called the Watchful Peace. When Sauron returns to Dol Guldur it becomes clear that something dark has returned to the region and the Watchful Peace ends. A new white council is founded as an answer by Galadriel in 3rd age 2463 including her, Gandalf, Saruman, Elrond, Círdan and other elven lords at least at the first meeting. Gandalf was chosen to be the leader by Galadriel but he declined and so Saruman was chosen. Círdan's role in the council seems more passive and not much is mentioned about him but of course he was part of it and passivity is a good way to describe the council too. They consist only of immortals and they have time. The next meeting would be 400 years later. 3rd age 2850 Gandalf went to Dol Guldur again and was able to confirm the necromancer's identity as Sauron this time. He summons the council and urges to attack Dol Guldur but Saruman, a powerful Maya himself, manages to persuade the council to wait, claiming to have evidence that the One Ring is lost in the ocean. Gandalf is not happy about this but probably can't fully see through Saruman's plans and treachery at this point. Even Elrond, Círdan and Galadriel are not able to. However, identifying Sauron was still the strongest move of Gandalf in the history of the Third Age because it forced Sauron to make moves. Also Gandalf found Thrain, Thorin Oakenshield's father in the dungeons of Dol Guldur. From him he got the key and map of Erebor. If he could combine at this time that Durin's ring, the last of the seven rings of power of which four got destroyed by Dragonfire was now too in Sauron's possession it's hard to say but he definitely found out later because he explained this during Elrond's council. However all this will lead to the quest for Erebor and with this to Bilbo finding the one ring, the most important event of the third age and the defeat of Smaug which stabilized the region around Erebor. During the quest for Erebor in The Hobbit 3rd age 2941 the White Council meets again and agrees this time to attack Dol Guldur. The exact reason for this and the decisions of the White Council I explain in my Istari video in case you are raising some questions now. The Council attacks Sauron and the Dark Lord finally returns to Mordor. The last meeting of the White Council is 3rd age 2953, two years after Sauron's open declaration, discussing the rings of power, most of them in possession of Sauron. Also all three elven rings of power are within the council. Saruman assures again that he knows that the one ring is lost into the ocean. This is also the last council. After this Saruman isolates himself in Isengard. The next mention of Círdan is within the Lord of the Rings. Círdan is not present for Elrond's council for unknown reasons but he at least sends Galdor to represent him. Maybe he knows that fate will unfold from now on and powers greater than him will be at work. The last mention is at the very end. He greets the ring bearers at the gates of the Grey Havens. As they came to the gates Círdan the shipwright came forth to greet them. Very tall he was and his beard was long and he was grey and old save that his eyes were keen as stars and he looked at them and bowed and said all is now ready. What happens with Círdan after that? I don't know but it is likely that he will leave Middle Earth with the last ship in the fourth age. In the final scene of the Lord of the Rings films it seems that all leave Middle Earth together but in the books it's a bit different. Galadriel for example leaves before Celeborn and later Legolas and Gimli but also Sam will leave Middle Earth too. This however takes 120 years of the fourth age. It is said that Legolas builds the ship himself. Círdan is not mentioned so he probably is gone by this time. We can read that he once said something almost like a prophecy to Gandalf when the wizard arrived and his prophecies should become true. But as for me my heart is with the sea and I will dwell by the grey shores until the last ship sails. I will await you. Thank you for watching. This video was planned as a short one because as you probably have noticed there is not much written about Círdan. 
What made this video so long is all the things happening around Kirdan and explaining what the impact of him was. In the end this video is more the history of the Noldor and Teleri elves but I hope you still enjoyed it. It was a massive amount of work and writing the 23 pages long script took forever. If you liked it please consider pressing the like button and leaving a comment. I will read all and answer questions and feedback. If you managed to watch to this point and don't want to miss future content feel free to subscribe. All those functions help my channel a lot. I will continue with some shorter videos. Next could be a video about a gaming related topic. Lore wise I will talk about the planned Lord of the Rings related Amazon series. And I will also continue with my Lord of the Rings film law analysis series. We are still at the beginning so topic will be the Hobbit culture and history. A need for feedback video is also on my list. What the next big lore video will be I haven't decided yet. A video about the first Dark Lord Morgoth is pretty high on my list but that will be very work intensive and relatively close to this video. I'll likely move it to a later point this year or early next year. I really need to find a way to upload videos more frequently. Again thank you for watching and goodbye.